Welcome to the coming apocalypse. Evangelist and pastor Paul Bagley will take you on a journey into the end times prophecy. He'll examine current world events and explain how they relate to the end times. For decades, Pastor Bagley has provided people all over the world with an understanding of today's world events from a biblical perspective. Now, here's your host, Pastor Paul Bagley. Are you serious? Welcome. This is the coming apocalypse. And uh, my wife, Heidi Bagley, is joining us today. This is going to be, please, please, get a box of tissues. And just in case, it's going to be a a broadcast that's going to touch your heart. There's no question. It's a miracle, a series of miracles, as Heidi, her, her book, Finding My Father, was an incredible spiritual journey, an emotional journey, but a great journey. Yes. Heidi, tell us about your story, uh, Finding Your Father. Well, where do you start? My father left when I was three uh, months old, never to be seen again. And uh, of course, that just leaves a void, and you keep looking everywhere. You look in other people to see if somebody looks like you. you. You look in the phone books to see if there's anybody else with their last name. You look all over the place, and, and there's always a void, always a void, no matter. Um, I did have a stepfather, and unfortunately, he passed away when I was seven, suddenly. And then uh, my mother remarried again. I had another stepfather who adopted me. So, uh, but still never, never knew where my biological father was or, my, or his family. Um, so suddenly, about the time I turned 30 years old, I just had this urgency that almost turned into an obsession. I think you would call it an obsession. I would say it was an obsession. <laughs> To, to find my father, and I was just searching everywhere. Was literally, I took the white pages, and I was just calling his last name Stubblefield. I was calling every Stubblefield in the book and every white page that I could find. And I had two pieces of information. One was his birth certificate, and he was born in Sykeston, Missouri. And one was his social, social security card. So I put one of those uh, messages in the newspaper in Sykeston, Missouri, saying, you know, does anybody know Donald Stubblefield, et cetera. And a, a lady in a nursing home actually wrote me back a letter and said that she had knew my grandfather and he had passed away and that she knew um, uh, my great aunt. And uh, she actually still had her address and phone number, although it had been years, and perhaps I, I could go from there. And lo and behold, my aunt was in Kokomo, Indiana, not far from us. And um, so sure enough, that really was my aunt. And, uh, and she put me in touch with my grandmother. So things started to come into place. But the funny thing was, before that, like six weeks before that, a uh, pastor from Monon, Don Newman, yep. had called you up yep. because you were on the radio. Yep. And he said, hey, I just like to, I like what you're doing on the radio. I just wanted to touch base with you, let you know that I'm listening and I, and I really like it and maybe we can get together sometime. Right, yeah. And so eventually we got down to see my aunt to meet her and the picture up on her fireplace was? Don Newman. <laughs> I'm sitting there, I look up and it's the preacher who had called me out of the blue. And he still pastors in Mona. And I asked your aunt, I said, do you know that guy? <laughs> and she says, that's my son. So God was already pulling some, that was miracle number one. Oh, mm -hmm. wait, the lady in the nursing home after 40 years writing you back. That's maybe uh -huh. miracle number one, right? I don't know. There's so many miracles. But uh, so, yes, Don Newman, who pastors in Monon, is my cousin. Right. Who had already contacted us and we didn't know. And, and the funny thing is my family's from California. So how we already just suddenly had ties from, to Indiana was unbelievable. Right. But my aunt put me in touch with my grandmother in California. We went out to California to, to meet her, met my aunt yes, and uh, all the family out there. And, you know, that helped, that helped fill in voids, but it never filled in the void for my father. They had lost contact with my father years ago as well. Nobody knew where my father was. How was you feeling during that time, though? Was, uh, how, did, uh, how was you feeling? Well... It was ups and downs because every time you would hear uh, that 
this is my grandmother. And just the phone call to call my grandmother and tell her who I was, which of course her, her sister had already filled her in because she called her first. Um, you know, it was like, are they, you know, are they going to like me? You know, well, what's, what are, what's their situation? I mean, who knows how they're living? They live in California. It's totally different than Indiana. And um, I would be excited and scared and uh, nervous all at the same time. It was just a myriad of emotions always going on. And, uh, and to actually meet my grandmother was amazing. And, and again, when you're, when you're not raised up with your biological family, you, you're looking for something. You're looking, is, do I look like them? No. <laughs> uh, most of my family was little petite, dark hair. Um, but all of a sudden, inbounded a uh, little girl, of my, my cousin's little girl, her name was Victoria, and it was like looking back at me. She had these blue eyes and this blonde hair and the same kind of build, and it was like, oh, I do fit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that was, that was good. You know, that was a, a, a feeling like I finally belonged somewhere. Um, so that was an uh, amazing part of that. But uh, I don't know where, where you want me well, to go from there. Well, at this point, okay. <laughs> so you found there, but still, no one has any idea where your father is. No. Or, and most people say he's dead. Yes. Because or if he's found, to stay away from him. Okay, because he went to prison. He went to prison. He escaped with another guy. Mm -hmm. The other guy dies in the desert. Right. They assume the FBI is looking everywhere. The FBI assumes he's dead out there somewhere. Yes. So everyone's basically trying to tell you, you know, Heidi, leave it be. Let it go. And especially Paul Bigley. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you know, <laughs> maybe this was the journey. You know? <laughs> yes. But uh, but when God puts a word in you, mm -hmm. when you get a rhema word, you know, mm -hmm. you know it's God. You have to go for it. I had to go for it. So what happened after that? So finally, I have the Social Security card. That was the other piece of information. So I call Social Security, and I finally get a woman on the phone. I had to call like three times before, because you know all the privacy acts. And I finally get a lady on the phone who says, "Your father's alive." I'm looking right at the number. Wow. And uh, want, says that she may send a letter on, or she may not. So I send a letter to Social Security. And she and forwarded it on. She apparently forwarded it on because three months go by. So I'm assuming either she didn't forward it on or he got the letter, in which I was very careful in my wording of the letter because who knows the situation? Does he have another family? Why has he never tried to contact me? And so I tried to be very careful in the wording of the letter. And uh, I, then I figure either he doesn't want to contact me or she didn't send it, but we were pastoring, and we were having an elders meeting, Right. and all of a sudden the phone rings, and um, I hear the voice, and it says, I'm, I believe I'm your father. Right. So what do you do as a pastor's wife in the middle of an elders meeting getting a call like that? You break down and cry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got up and excused myself and went into the bedroom to try to understand this conversation. He tells me that he's in California, on the beach, in the recycling business. Okay. And boy, my emotions were everywhere then. It was like, I'm angry because you're on the beach. That's, that's real nice, <laughs> you know. Where have you been for yeah. 30 years? Where have you been? And, uh, but at the same time, I don't want to, you know, make him never call me again. I just have, this is the first contact I've ever had in my life. Right. So I don't want to be angry. <laughs> it was just emotions everywhere. And then come back into the room with the elders meeting. And it, everything's normal because I'm a <laughs> pastor's wife. <laughs> and I'm wondering the whole time, what in the world has just happened? Because I, you know, mm -hmm. I can read your emotions maybe a little better than the rest of them could and I knew something significant had happened right and um, um, but it didn't the journey doesn't stop there does it, it goes. and when we come right back mm -hmm. we're going to get as Paul Harvey would say the rest <laughs> of the story we'll be right yes. back
Folks, let me tell you something. I have a book I really recommend you should get. You go to my website at www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. I have a book entitled The Zombie Apocalypse. Now, it has to do with actual 35 actual accounts of demonic possession and manifestations that uh, is very troubling but will help you understand how demon spirits actually work in these last days. I highly recommend you get it also for your teens and college students to help explain to them the pitfalls to not fall into these uh, sorcery or witchcraft seances, Ouija boards, or some video games that could alter the mind and the soul of your child. Again, this book, it's only at my website at www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. There you'll find it on the products page. It'll be a blessing to you, insightful, and you'll bless the ministry. Oh, yes, welcome back, welcome back. This is the coming apocalypse, but here's the softer side of Paul Begley, the better half, all right? My wife, Heidi Begley, is telling an unbelievable, powerful, true story, finding my father, You've, you wrote a book about it. It took you a long time. Yes. First, it takes you 30 years to find them. So pick up where you left off, where we're at right now. All right. So I get the phone call finally from my father. And uh, in the meantime, he sends me maybe a couple postcards in the mail. And I'm trying to understand what's going on with my father and, and understand this uh, because uh, he, he can't read or write. So, he can't read or write, so, so you're So he's sending me just postcards, and I'm trying to decipher from that. And suddenly I get a call from the hospital, and it says, Your father almost died. You're the only living relative. He will need long-term care. You need to come get him out of California, out of uh, Santa Monica, California. And I have not met him yet. I've just been getting a phone call and a couple postcards and trying to understand him. Wow. And so I get on a plane to California to Santa Monica, which it was the first time I ever flew. <laughs> and that was an experience getting down the jetway. But I, I did it. I got to Santa Monica. I walk into the room, and I'm looking at my father, who has a beard down to here. And he has hair way down his back. And, uh, but he has these blue eyes peering back at me. And so. That was confirmation through all that hair <laughs> that, that he was my father. And um, we have a conversation. A lot of it has to do with God. And I'm thinking, is he just saying that because he knows I'm a pastor's wife, or is this really him? And, um, and the, in the meantime, the social services is trying to get me to commit to getting him home and getting him in long-term care, and I'm still reeling in my emotions about what is going on here. Well, he's, he's homeless uh, on Venice Beach in California, and a uh, drug user, and uh, just wrapped up in a lot of things. And uh, I, being from the Midwest, had no idea of the homeless problem in California, but I was gonna find out real soon. And so um, I go back to the hotel room just to try to pull my thoughts together. Are you angry here? I mean, he's, he was, but he was kind, wasn't he, when you were talking? He was very kind, very kind. So are you upset? Are you angry? Are you glad? I mean, what's the emotions? Mm, I think scared <laughs> was one of the biggest emotions uh, because I was just didn't know what I was dealing with. Uh, I was scared, but I was relieved at the same time. But... Here, here this void is filled with a man who has a lot of issues. Right. So now I've got more now issues. You've got more now issues. I've got more now issues. Now you need tissues. Now I need tissues, yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so I go to the hotel room just to try to think, what am I going to do? I have three little children at home because the boys were, oh, I don't know how old, 12-ish or something yeah. like that. And uh, so I have three children at home that I have to think about. And I have, you know, my father who's, who's very ill. He's going to need kidney dialysis is what's the matter with him. His kidneys were in failure. And, um, and so I, I think I have a plan. I am a nurse. So, right, I pull out my nursing hat. I, I can do this, right? <laughs> and I think I pull a plan together and I call the hospital back. 
and uh, they said he he left he left against medical advice he's got a catheter in him and he is not going to survive he will possibly live four to six weeks and with the homeless population they don't carry I identification so we can't tell you if we'll even be able to notify you once his body comes back and then they were that callous because wow. they deal with the homeless day in and day right. out and it means not a whole lot to them Wow. So what was I supposed to do? My plane ticket was for three more days. So I went to the beach. I went to Venice Beach. I said, I'm going to try to figure out what this homeless population is all about. If I can understand that, at least I'll have that understanding of my father if that's all I ever get. Right. And I was just abhorred because I saw so many homeless people, vets, uh, veterans, and they were very ill. They were in wheelchairs. A lady was walking around with her leg in a splint, and it was and it looked very bad. And literally, people were sitting on cafes. And Santa Monica is a rich area of California. Yeah. They were sitting in cafes, outside cafes, eating steak, drinking wine, with somebody literally picking through the garbage behind them. And I couldn't understand that. I just I mean, that was just breaking your heart. I mean, I just being a nurse and and being from the Midwest culture, it was just I couldn't understand why everybody wasn't stopping and doing something about what was going on here. Right. And um, so that's that's all I could could do was try to understand the homeless population in California so that I could take that understanding back with me. I figured that's all that I would ever have. So you go back home. I go back home. I get one phone call from my father. He says, it's raining here. I'm freezing. He sounds terrible. It was about four weeks later. He can't tell me where he's at, and he just hangs up. So what do you do? You pray. have to pray. You pray. Okay. Then when there's nothing else left to do, that's all you can do. You have to just pray. So then two weeks later, he finally calls me, and he says he's ready to come to Indiana. He bought himself a plane ticket. Uh, he didn't want to burden me, and he was waiting for a Social Security check to come in. So I, I talked to him, and I'm like, you have to let them take care of you. If I bring you to Indiana, that's fine, but you have to allow us to help you. And he agreed to that. Okay. And luckily, I had uh, been working with a doctor who had graduated from Oral Roberts University, and I knew that he had enough uh, kindness and patience with him that he would be able to work through this situation. So uh, I brought him straight to where I worked at the little tiny town called in Winnemac, Indiana. And Dr. Johnson took care of him. He took care of him for the rest of his life. What about the reaction though on the airport when this, <laughs> this man yes. gets off the plane? He looks right. like Charles Manson. Yes. I mean, he really did. Yes. <laughs> it was 5 o'clock in the morning. His plane flew in. He actually met Charles Manson. Yeah, I mean, yeah told us that he later. Did. Go ahead. Um, and Everybody in, in Indianapolis is trying to tell me with their eyes to get away from this man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, run, right, <laughs> you yeah. know? because he does, he looks so bad. Yeah. Um, but we get him to the hospital, and Dr. Johnson takes care of him. But Dr. Johnson immediately turns to me, and he's like, you have three little children at home. I'm worried about you and your family. And, uh, and, but through the grace of God, we worked it out. We got him an apartment. And he didn't need kidney dialysis, and Dr. Johnson verified that that was a miracle. Praise God. Mm -hmm. He did need a minor surgery, and that was taken care of, but he didn't need long-term care. But he, now he's in Indiana, and now we get him an apartment, and now we have a lot to learn as well as he has a lot right. to learn. He's very grateful that his, he's met me. Now he's met his grandchildren. He never, ever thought he would see his grandchildren, much less his daughter. And... Um, we start learning how, how to socialize somebody who's been laying on the beach for all these years. And uh, we buy him a bed. He can't sleep in it. Can't sleep in a bed. He's not slept in a bed for years. He doesn't sleep at night because at no you can't sleep at night on the beach. You, they, they'll allow you during the day. So we get a call from uh, the police that he's coming down to the park in, in Knox, Indiana. <laughs> And trying to sleep in the park during the day, which is not gonna, that's just not gonna happen in Knox, right. Indiana. <laughs> so I have this huge willow tree in my yard, and I bring him to my house and let him sleep under the willow tree during the day. And he could sleep then. And he could sleep peacefully yeah. under the willow tree. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, but he said he he always said he missed the sound of the waves because he yeah. slept by the sound of the waves. But uh, just all different things. We we would buy him food, and he would eat it ferociously right away. And we understood then that he realized he thought that, it's that was run his out. last meal. It's gonna run out. Got to eat it now. So we filled his pantry full of canned goods and explained to him that you've got meals from here on out. You don't have to worry about it. And just little things like that. I'd buy him clothes, he'd give them away. You, you couldn't give him furniture because he did furnish his apartment out of the dumpsters. <laughs> he, <laughs> and he, he did a good job. He actually did. Every piece of furniture in his house was, com was stuff he found. Right. And it was, he never paid a dime for it. He nope. said, look at this, I'm the richest man in the world. Yes. And he couldn't read or write either. No. And he could, so but he wanted to read the Bible, but that's a little bit later. But, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what he did. He started reading the Bible. And Dude. God gave him the grace that he was able to read the Bible. Yeah, he, we got him some audio yes. CDs. He put them in, and he would just let them play all day and open the Bible and look at it. Mm -hmm. And within two, three years, he was reading the Bible. Yes. And it was an amazing transformation there. Yes. Well, he got saved. Well, we well, 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 ahead. we'll okay. tell that in just a moment. All right. We'll, that was another story. Yes. We'll be right back, folks, in just a minute. All right. A brand new book I've just finished called Reflections from the Land of the Prophets. This book is filled with beautiful pictures, a pictorial, if you will, of the Holy Land and some definite great insight to the prophets that once spoke mightily in the times leading us up to the present. It's a prophetic word, a reflection of what God has spoken not only historically from the past but for the future. Go to my website. It's available now. Welcome back. This is the coming apocalypse. Uh, my wife Heidi, this story is just touching. All right, your dad's not saved, but he wants to be. Tell us. It didn't take much for him to get saved, for him to accept Christ, because he would tell us that he knew it was only by the grace of God that he lived through everything that he had lived through all these years. So that was easy for him to get saved and accept Christ. And then we had an alms center where we gave out free clothing, and we had a Joseph's house where we gave out free food, and he was more than happy to help us work the alms center and Joseph's house within the church. And um, and he he just he needed a haircut. He yeah, decided, he needed a haircut. He decided it was time to get a haircut. Okay, okay, yeah. And he says to me, uh, "I think I need to get a haircut." I said, "Really?" <laughs> Okay, because he looked like the Oak Ridge boy guy, you know. I said, okay. He goes, uh, what you? he goes, who's your barber? Well, you have to understand, my barber was Curly in North Judson, Indiana, sort of like Mayberry, okay? <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm thinking, I can't bring him in there. They're going to freak out. So I call Curly. I say, look, my father-in-law, he just got back from California. He's a hippie. He wants to get a haircut. And uh, uh, can we do it after hours? Okay, and he said, "No, bring him in on Saturday morning. You know when everybody's there." <laughs> so we do, and uh, uh, he gets a haircut and a shave, and, and uh, he w he was in the process of a transformation. Yes. But the thing about him was, he was the most kind and most grateful individual I believe I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And you're, and I'm the whole time I'm thinking, this is why God you. You wanted her to find him. He's another lost soul. Mm. But you heard Heidi's prayers. You, you know, your prayers to find your father. Right. The draw, but you didn't just only find your physical father, did you, Heidi? Mm. Wasn't you also in a journey with the Heavenly Father? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit that, about that? Well, that, that would take another show, probably. Well, okay. <laughs> but uh, long story short, it's just very difficult when you when you're... Your natural father should lead you towards your heavenly father. And I had already been through three natural fathers and was having a hard time finding my heavenly father through those examples. Um, but the restoration of this relationship did eventually lead me to uh, the relationship so e with my heavenly father. So even though you're saved, mm -hmm. you're still having some issues Father issues. Father issues with the <laughs> Heavenly Father. Yes. And there's people watching right now that may be in the exact same situation. I'm sure there is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where maybe life has been rough and they've come through some tough 
a, a, a divorced home. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they lost their parents when they were young. Uh, you know, our, our foster parents are overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're living in a world where homes are not staying together like they were. Right. So there could be people who have accepted Jesus Christ, have been born again, mm -hmm. but need some, still need some healing. Is, was that your case? Yes. And I would just continue to repeat over and over that by the spirit of adoption. You know, I would cry, Abba, Father, by the spirit of adoption. And until I finally could get that in my spirit, I would just, that is way, the way I finally mended the relationship with my Heavenly Father, is to understand that it was by the spirit of adoption that I was there. And I had been adopted, so... So you understood that. So I understood that, and I understood that you you have every right to every inheritance um, as an adoption, as a natural child. So. So your father did pass away. He did. And um, and uh, it, but our children and our grandchildren, some of them when they were young, were able to meet him, and yes. And he made a great impact in our community, and the church community loved him. Yes. And uh, it shows you that never give up on anybody. Right. Because God will never give up on you. And that's the love of God, is to reach past all the pain and still give us hope and joy. So I think about people watching right now, I, I think you might be suicidal. You might be to a point where you just want to give up. You think nobody loves you. I promise you, God loves you. And there's a family. When you come to Jesus Christ, you join the family. You become brothers and sisters in Christ. And then, no matter what the obstacle is, you will overcome it. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Some of you watching right now, please, why don't you go to my website, and there's somebody in the chat room waiting, and just type in there and say, look, I want to get saved. Why don't you call on the name of the Lord and ask Jesus into your heart, just like your father did. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, there is hope for you, and God's got a marvelous, wonderful life for you. If you give him a chance, watch and see what he'll do for you. We'll be back next week with a whole lot more on Bible prophecy right here on the coming apocalypse. <laughs> Heidi Begley's got a brand new book called Finding My Father. Heidi, this is a miracle journey, isn't it? A miracle how you found your father. A journey just full of miracles. He left when I was three months old, found him again when I was 30 years old. And it's just miracle after miracle. It's a page turner, it's a tear jerker, <laughs> and I guarantee it will change people's lives.